when they got Cedric into custody, they had found a casing, bullet casing, inside of his pocket. What's up everybody and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for choosing my video to click on. My name is Keisha Jackson and it's Tuesday. And it's Street Crime Tuesday. Yeah. Last week I spoke about Ronald Cohen. What a piece of work. Honestly, goodness gracious. And then I still got... um someone very close to me saying that the stories aren't as violent as they thought they would be so before i dig into the story today i just want to put out a disclaimer because this one is i know i say every week that this is such a heavy story but this one is a heavy story so viewer discretion is advised the story i will be telling today contains scenes of violence rape and just uh, gross stuff so, if you're sensitive, please give this a skip, but don't forget to give me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. It really helps me. So today, guys, jeez Louises. Today I'm going to be speaking about Cedric Mackay. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. Maybe you know him because he's the Wimmerpan killer. Cedric Mackay was born on the 10th of September. September, like it was just his birthday the other day, 1963 in Limpopo, South Africa. It doesn't have much about his family history, even when he was interviewed he didn't want to say much about them, but they did grow up of course in poverty and just like Moses, his dad at the time was the breadwinner. When Cedric was 12 years old, he was sent to live in the bush for three months as a part of a traditional initiation where they would send the young boys to the bush to come into manhood and to prove that they could provide for themselves and a family one day. Cedric describes this time of his life as barbaric. Quote, he described it as barbaric. He said it was barbaric because they were left without any food or water, so... Unfortunately, Cedric's dad passed away when he was in grade 10, and this automatically forced Cedric to leave school to provide for his family, which left him a little bit bitter. After his father passed away, Cedric then came to Joburg to work as a plumber. But back in Limpopo, he had a wife and four kids. When Cedric was 33 years old, he was living in La Rochelle, Johannesburg. And this is where all the, all the nonsense would start. 28th of December 1996. Cedric walks into Heel Gardens Cafe in Rosettenville. He then, just out of the blue, attacks this poor man by the name of Antonio, Al Antonio Alfonso with a hammer and then steals 400 rand. 400 rand, guys. What the hell? With this 400 rand, he would go on and celebrate the new year. Fortunately, Antonio survived the attack with mild head injury. This would be the beginning of what is called the Hammer Series. 6th of January, 1997, 10am in the morning, Cedric walks into Mahan Kanji's shop. He then proceeds to tell Mahan, I hope I'm saying that right, that he is a plumber and he needs his pants to be repaired. He also said he needed a second-hand pair of pants and while Mahan was tallying up or bagging up or whatever it was, the pants, he then attacks this poor 78-year-old man with a spanner hitting the left side of his head he then fell to the ground and Cedric continues to attack this man and then flees. Fortunately, Mahan survives the attack, but he never fully recovers. Mm, 
two days later, Cedric then enters Terminus Butchery, the Sedanote Avenue Troyville, and proceeds to attack a man by the name of Kenny Chan. He then stole money and fled. Fortunately, Kenny survived. Yay, everyone's surviving, guys. I'm so happy for them. 16th of January, 1997. 10 days after his first two attacks. 10 to 8 days. Let me just say that. After his first two attacks, Cedric walks into a shop called Valpa Tailors. Cedric then says to the tailor by the name of Kanatali. Kanatali. I hope I'm saying these names right, guys. Excuse me if I'm not. Um, he says he needs some alterations done to pants. Can he alter them? The tailor then proceeds to do his alterations while Cedric is waiting in the shop. After the alterations are done, Cedric then says, I need some repairs on my hammer. Do you know where I can get that done? The tailor then says, yes, yeah, well, there's, a, there's a hardware shop just right around the corner. Did I tell you where this place is? Sorry, guys. Do Dorfontaine. This is where this tailor was. He says, yeah, there's a, a hardware right around the corner. You can go and have it repaired there. I'm sure they'll know what to do for you. Cedric then leaves to go and have his hammer repaired and he returns. He then says that he wants to purchase shoes on labor. So the tailor does that for him. And as the tailor is cashing everything up and putting his pants in, Cedric then attacks the tailor with a hammer. The tailor then falls unconscious. When he wakes up, he sees that Cedric had left the hammer behind. Cedric did steal some money from the till and fortunately the tailor survived with several skull fractures and a clot in his brain. Let's talk about how hard he got hit, guys. Cedric would go on to commit crimes like these and when I say he would go on to commit, when I say he would go on to commit crimes like these, I mean he would go on to robbing and attacking tailors in particular. Also, people that do shoe repairs and you know, poor men just trying to make an honest living. From January nineteen ninety six to April nineteen ninety six, Cedric would commit these crimes, and they would go on to be known as the Hammer Crimes or the Hammer Series. I don't know why, it was never stated why Cedric now decided to move, but he moved on to committing some crimes in Wemmerpan. The 27th of April, 1997. I feel like I said six before. I apologize if I did. Elijah and Eunice are chilling in Elijah's car at Wemmerpan Lake, just enjoying the view, you know, having some time together. It's a lovely time over there at the Wemmerpan Lake. It's very serene. Apparently, it was the go-to place for couples back in that time. Without any words, Cedric approaches Eliza, shoots him in the back of the head. He then held poor Eunice up at gunpoint drove her to the nearest mine dump, violently raped her, and then killed her as well. The police then go to Elijah's home to notify whoever is there, and Elijah's wife answers the door. Sneaky, sneaky bastard. So not only does Elijah's wife have to find out that her husband died, got brutally murdered, but she also has to find out it was with another woman. That same night that Cedric had murdered and raped poor Eunice, on his way back he came across another lady and he also bludgeoned her with a rock and then violently raped her. Makes me sick. May 25th, 1997. Cedric gets into a taxi. He waits until he is the last person in the taxi and then he directs the taxi driver to Compound Road near Wemapan. This is where he would pull out his firearm, threaten the taxi driver for his money, and then shoot the taxi driver several times. Fortunately, the taxi driver survived. He only got away with 300 Rand from the taxi driver, just by the way, guys. 
So in my mind, I'm just going to push my personal opinion in there quickly. He is not doing this for the money. I feel like he is stealing and murdering just because he likes it. He would then go on to... This was... Sorry, this is Cedric's pattern. I'm going to explain Cedric's pattern to you. In Wemapan, he would kill couples. Especially couples that would go to the Wemapan Lake for recreational purposes. So he would find couples, kill the male, hold the female up at gunpoint, violently rape her and then kill her as well. And then he would move on to the next one. After he had murdered a couple in July of 1997, the Wemmerpan series investigation began. This was led by Captain Pitt Bayerfelt. I hope I'm saying his surname correctly. They never connected the hammer murders or the hammer attacks to the Wemmerpan killings. They had thought it was two separate serial killers working at the same time, which wasn't an uncommon thing. Fuck. Cedric became more sexually sadistic with his crimes and it was reported that at one point when he had held a couple up at the Wemmerpan Lake, he had even forced them to have sex with each other while he watched and... 18th of July 1997, Cedric goes on to kill five couples in one day. Record breaking. Five couples in one day. All at different like places, different spaces, different spots. And the police are just Mr. Pitt is just investigating this slowly, thoroughly, he's investigating these things. August 1997, Cedric returns to attacking tailors. Because, you know, maybe police are hot on his heels now. He wants to swerve them off of it. He attacked a poor man by the name of Louis. So he attacks this man in the same manner that he had attacked every other Taylor. This time, this time, he leaves the weapon behind. He also leaves a wallet and a pair of shoes that had been newly repaired. Now, instead of this tailor keeping it for evidence, he goes on to sell the items. Like, why? From August to November, Cedric attacked tailors with a hammer just to steal minuscule amounts of money. And when I mean minuscule, I mean lower than 100 rand. 40 rand here, 5 rand there, 10 rand here, 10 rand there. It was just, like I said before, I don't think he was doing it for the money. At this time, Captain Pitt Bailefelt, remember Mr. Pitt, is like, getting anxious now and the Asian community is up in arms because all these crimes are being committed and nothing seems to be getting done about it. So the Asian people, you know, the Asian tailors and the tailoring, ta Miss Taylor, the tailoring community discuss amongst themselves what can be done. Captain Bailefelt decides that the best option for them would be to put security cameras in the in the shops you know to see what's going on the asian the the tailoring they say asian community in the research that i've done they are not happy about it they are like so all you're gonna do for us is security cameras they are making a big scene about it and it becomes public knowledge so it's splashed out in the news because the tailors are now speaking to the media and Cedric catches wind of this and he's like shit they are after me now so he's like I'm gonna slow my rolls I'm gonna slow my rolls on killing people with hammers and I'm gonna go into breaking and entering burglary home invasions that's the correct word for it burglary breaking home invasions 
Now, when he committed these home invasions, he also violently attacked the people in the homes, killing them and much too much and everyone's surprise, raping the woman. Okay, so I hated my look, but I'm not going to start the whole video over again. So I'm just going to keep on going. My eyes are a bit sensitive right now because I legit just ripped everything off of them. I was not feeling the vibes, guys. From the 7th of November to the 19th of December, 1997, Cedric would go on to attack 14 other people via his new home invasion spell. The captain on these cases, he's getting angry now. He's like, you know what, eh? I'm getting agitated. I'm going to put a thing out to ask women that maybe have ever come in contact with Cedric or rape victims. They, they need to come forward and they need to give me descriptions and we need to sort this out because not many more people can die at the hands of Cedric. So at this point, police know nothing. They don't know anything about Cedric. They don't know his whereabouts. They don't know what the hell is actually going on. They're just hoping for the best when it comes to this victim questioning. Captain ba Baverfeld, whatever, he proceeds to question Cedric's victims. And the victims would state that he was very short in stature. He was a tiny man, but he was very strong and very aggressive. He would also boast about his previous victims and his previous crimes whilst committing the crime on them. He would also like to have the victims beg for their lives. Late December 1997, Captain Felt. Hey, I got it back. Captain Bailefelt got his big break in this case. Before this, though, let me just add this, guys. Before this big break, a, fee a fellow female co-worker of Captain ba ba Bailefelt, Bailefelt, there it is, staged a stakeout at the Wemmerpan Lake with the captain to see if they could lure the Wemmerpan killer in. But nothing came of that. Thank goodness she didn't do it alone or like do it with an actual boyfriend. I don't think she was that dumb. But thank goodness that that didn't happen. So late December, Captain Bailefelt, ooh, I think I said it right the first time in this video, got his big break. When a caller, civilian, called in to say, oh guys, I just want to say something quickly before I carry on with the story. I'm going to do a review sometime when I get back from a holiday. I'm using this new foundation. Hold up. Hold the phone. There it is. This new Wet n Wild Photo Focus Foundation. Wet n Wild is a cruelty-free vegan brand. It says it so in the little corner there. And it also states at the back here. It's vegan. I have tried this out. I must be honest. And from what I've seen, I don't know if I like it. That's just a quick insight, guys. Anyway, let's carry on with Cedric. So Captain Bay Bailefelt gets this call. And he's like so excited because this woman, it was a woman that called, is describing exactly what the victims have previously described. So he's like, yeah, yeah. And it was said he was wearing green trousers and a jersey, like a knitted sort of jersey. And he was lurking around the local hotel. But he never ate or drank anything there, nor did he sleep there. And he was also not a homeless person in the area. So this is everything that the this, this civilian is telling Captain Bailefelt. So Captain Bailefelt is so amped because this description matches perfectly. And he's like, yo, yo, getting to work. So he gets really excited. And he tells his team, we are going to stake out there by this hotel. And we're going to check what's happening. 
the civilian that called had also said it seems like he might be in a relationship of some sort with a lady that is living at this hotel. So Captain Bailefelt investigates who this woman might be, and this woman is Angela. Cedric's girlfriend. Now Cedric has a girlfriend, but he's has a wife as well and four kids. So Bailefelt they stake out on the 23rd of December 1997 at this local hotel and they watch him. At around 11 a.m. Angela decides to get into a taxi and proceed to Jeppy where she meets a man in green trousers and a matted jersey who happens to be Cedric. <laughs> Captain Bailerfeld is like, oh, we have him. When they got Cedric into custody, they had found a casing, bullet casing, inside of his pocket. What are you doing with a bullet casing, sir? So Cedric is taken into custody the 23rd of December, 1997. And Mr. Captain, sorry, not Mr. Captain Bailerfeld feels like the most relieved because he's... The streets are safe again, you know. But now we have an issue. We have an issue because Cedric does not like to be incarcerated. He didn't take well to it. Apparently, while they were investigating him, he would, like, throw feces and scream at the guards in the holding cell, you know. Because he was just claiming that this wasn't him. He is not the one that committed these murders. He's not this person that they're looking for. You know, deny, deny, deny. Whatever, Cedric. We know it was you. We know it was you. Captain Bailerfell sits down on Cedric, obviously to interrogate him. He's interrogating him now. And he says, why? Cedric, we know you're doing this, but why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Captain Bailerfeld then asks Cedric, why such a close connection to Taylor's? Like, why do you enjoy going to Taylor's so much? So Cedric says to Mr. Captain, why do I keep saying Mr. Cedric says to Mr. Bailerfeld, I like going, and this is where he got caught, to Taylor's because the woman that I rape ripped my clothes apart and I don't like that. I like looking neat. Guys, we are dealing with a real-life sociopath. Eventually, eventually, Cedric admits to the Hammer murders. Now, Captain Bailerfeld is like, what? I thought these were two separate killings. Now, when Cedric confessed, Captain Bailerfeld said that he didn't seem guilty or he didn't act guilty he kind of just boasted about it like oh yeah i did do this shame captain bailerfeld is like okay why did you kill the tailors like if you needed them you know to fix up your clothes and stuff why would you kill them and cedric then told captain bailerfeld and i quote one time, I went to a tailor and he messed my pants up. It angered me, and that's when I decided that I'm going to kill them. End quote. When it came time for Cedric to tell uh, Captain Bailerfeld about the Wemmerpan Lake killings, he asked Cedric why Wemmerpan Lake and why men and women, you know, because usually serial killers take to one type of thing in one type of way so for example if they want to murder a woman they're going to murder a woman and rape woman if they want to objectify men and kill men they're going to objectify men and kill only men like for example Moses Satole went after black women in general he never spread out to to men as well and um Cedric replied to Captain Bailerfeld by saying that his wife 
would come to visit from Limpopo and um, he had found out that in the times she would visit, she would be unfaithful with men on the heels of Wenupan Lake. Cedric's trial started April 1998. It lasted 335 days. Just hold on. The reason it lasted so long is because every single victim that survived testified. How nice is that? So, the state presents the judge presiding over the case with all the information and all these victims have testified and it's not looking good for Cedric. Every single one of his victims had testified and the state had testified. Cedric didn't say much at all um, from any of the research. The 19th of March 2000, Cedric got sentenced to 27 counts of murder. 27. Okay, look, it, it's nowhere near Moses Satole, but 27 counts of murder, 26 counts of attempted murder, 41 counts of aggro aggravated armed robbery, and 14 counts of rape. Cedric Macar, Ma Macar, whoever his surname is, was sentenced to 1,835 years behind bars. He is currently still serving his sentence in CMAX, Durban. I think it is he's in CMAX. There where that other prisoner tried to escape. <sighs> Madness, guys. Madness. I think, okay, so he was born in 1963. So he should be around like 56, 57 years old right now. His wife was devastated, by the way. I didn't even tell you guys. His wife was devastated when she found out that her husband was being um, investigated for these terrible, terrible crimes. And also his mom. His mom was devastated because this left her, this left her completely destitute because um, he was the one supporting her. And um, she didn't enjoy seeing her son in shackles. Serial killer, serial rapist. And I still want to know what goes through someone's mind to want to violate a woman in like the worst possible way that a woman can be violated. You know, we're strong, eh? We can go through a lot of mental shit and a lot of emotional shit, but to violate, violate a woman like that... While you guys are watching this video, I will be spending my anniversary, because it's my two-year wedding anniversary with my amazing husband. We will be away from civilization and society, and I'm so excited. I just want to thank you guys so much for spending your Tuesdays with me, and I see that I'm gaining viewers, and I'm gaining people that are interacting with me, and I'm I really appreciate it. But on a real note, I appreciate every single one of you that are committed to staying tuned to me every single Tuesday. Anyway, guys, please stay safe, stay vigilant. Remember that we are on level one. What? Guys, we've come so far. One Cyril. But please carry on staying safe. The virus is still out there. We are still trying to fight it. Enjoy this time. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining me once again. Please don't forget to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. Also, comment because I'm now talking to people. Please stay safe, like I've said, and I'll see you next week, Tuesday, for another True Ground. Peace.